Like when people don't know what Stonewall is. You know what I mean? They, well, won't, you tell, like, won't you tell everybody what that is? That was fighting for gay rights, mm -hmm. and people were killed. Nobody they were, was killed at Stonewall. Nobody was nobody killed? Nobody was killed at Stonewall. The Stonewall Riots of 1969 are often mentioned in passing as a product of the gay rights movement, a protest key to securing freedoms we take for granted today, and a relic of a past time when it was illegal to be queer in public. But what exactly were they, and what happened during them? Further, what impact did they have, and what did they fail in accomplishing? To understand the Stonewall Riots, we first have to understand the context behind them. In 1969, the Stonewall Inn was a gay club located in Greenwich Village in New York City, a neighborhood known as the epicenter of the city's 1960s counterculture movement. During this period, solicitation of same-sex relations was illegal in New York City. Because it was frowned upon to be visibly queer in public, LGBT individuals flocked to gay bars and clubs, essentially the only places they could call their own at this time. However, the New York State Liquor Authority penalized and shut down establishments that served alcohol to known or suspected LGBT individuals, arguing that the mere gathering of homosexuals was disorderly. These early gay bars were filthy, with unsanitary conditions and unsafe layouts, non-compliant with building codes, and oftentimes run by the Mafia. The reason they were run by the Mafia is that while the police saw disorderly outcasts, the Mafia saw a golden business opportunity. They were able to pay off the police, oftentimes significant amounts, because the business would just keep coming. And despite the subpar conditions, New York City queers had a place to call home, and a place to meet others of their community without social ramifications. It was when the police decided they'd had enough that the utopia was ripped from their fingers. Before we get to the events of the rioting, we have to understand why this resistance was just so unusual. During the height of the Cold War, there was a common fear of gay subversion of national security. The assumption by government officials was that should men in government be found as gay by Soviet or Soviet-aligned authorities, they could be blackmailed into releasing intelligence for fear of their sexuality being revealed. Such was the nature of being gay during this time, that it was seen as better to die with the secret than allow the secret to be revealed. Thus, U.S. authorities had reason to be concerned that homosexuals could subvert national security and resultantly purge them from all government positions, even those without any security clearances. Government employees were directly interrogated and asked questions about their sexual activity, and it is estimated that between 5,000 and 10,000 people lost their jobs during these events, with many taking their own lives. This paranoia over homosexuals in government positions was dubbed the Lavender Scare, and it sent many queer people into hiding. During the period of the 1950s and 60s, there was also scientific research into homosexuality, but oftentimes much of this research was in bad faith for the purpose of determining how to treat or eliminate it, as opposed to understanding it. In response to this research, Frank Kameni, a World War II veteran employed by the U.S. Army Map Service and fired for his sexuality, released a statement condemning the bad faith attempts to classify sexuality as an otherness, noting that, quote, I've never heard of a single instance of a heterosexual, whatever problems he may have been facing, inquiring about the nature or origins of heterosexuality, or asking why he was a heterosexual or considering these matters important, I fail to see why we should make similar inquiry in regard to homosexuality or consider the answers to these questions as being of any great moment to us. After all of Kameni's appeals to keep his job were denied, he co-founded the Washington, D.C. chapter of the Mattachine Society, arguing that homosexuality is not a sickness, but merely a preference. Wait a second, so what's a Mattachine Society? In response to circumstances such as the Lavender Scare, there were a number of gay rights movements prior to the Stonewall Uprising, each differing in method and mission. This period of LGBT activism during the 1950s and 60s was referred to as the homophile movement, and was a culmination of many different groups. One aspect of the activism of this time was the need for covert movements. Because it was social suicide to be visibly outwardly gay at this time, Homosexuals and queers oftentimes joined secretive, anonymous societies dedicated to advancing queer activism. The Mattachine Society began as a secret organization in Los Angeles in 1950, was structured internally similar to the organization of the Communist Party, and had anonymous leadership so that their names weren't even known by members. 
Many extensions to this organization were opened in other cities, including that in DC, which was co-opened by our friend Kameni. Okay, so the Lavender Scare happened, there were secret societies for gay people, and the Mafia used to run gay bars. What about the Stonewall Uprising? Now that we've established context for what gay rights movements looked like prior to the Stonewall Riots, we can begin to discuss the riots themselves. The reason these riots were so unusual is because they were the exact opposite of what society had come to expect from the gay rights movement at this time. Mattachine societies had taken a calm, peaceful approach to protest, attempting to demonstrate that gay men could participate in society much like anyone else. The most aggressive demonstrations of these groups were sit-ins, where they would be seated in a bar or restaurant, announce their sexuality, and upon refusal to be served, would sue the restaurant or bar on the basis of discrimination. These demonstrations were actually somewhat successful, as when the Commission on Human Rights ruled that gay individuals had a right to be served in bars, police raids on gay bars were temporarily reduced. But it was when the police raided the Stonewall Inn, a bar that was supposed to be a safe haven, paid off by the mafia and safe from the outside world, that the patrons of the bar inside decided that they'd had enough. Greenwich Village was a uniquely queer district in the city, and even the straight people that lived there were generally sympathetic to the LGBT. Most of Stonewall's patrons were working in middle-class whites in their teens, 20s, and 30s, but there was a significant presence of African Americans and Latinos as well. Gay men, drag queens, street queens, trans people, sex workers, and queers without labels frequented the bar, as did a small number of lesbians. On the night of the raid, police lost control of the situation because everyone fought back. It wasn't just an instance of the police attacking one or two fringe individuals. On this night, the police lost control of the raid when patrons and passerby, LGBT and straight, fought back with words, wits, and then weapons in what became a gay power riot. Over the next few days, thousands of New Yorkers battled the police for control of the streets near the Stonewall, leading to an unprecedented resistance against what was intended as routine oppression. So what did the police do to the patrons that made them just so mad? When the police raided the Stonewall Inn on the morning of June 28, it came as a total surprise. The bar wasn't notified of a raid at this time, which was customary. Armed with the warrant, police officers entered the club, physically assaulted patrons, and upon the discovery of bootlegged alcohol, arrested 13 people, including employees and people violating the state's gender-appropriating clothing statute. Fed up with constant police harassment and racial discrimination, angry patrons and neighborhood residents started to accumulate outside of the bar, as opposed to fleeing the area, the expected response by police. People became increasingly upset as bargoers were manhandled, and at one point, an officer hit a woman over the head as he forced her into a van. She shouted for onlookers to act, inciting the crowd to begin to throw pennies, bottles, cobblestones, and other objects at the police. As the police became increasingly aggressive, the crowds became increasingly angry, and soon swarms of people had surrounded them, hurling objects and insults at the oppressors. While the mob enclosed them, the police attempted to restrain some individuals from the bar, which incited further anger. As the crowd tried to overturn the police wagon, the police left the area, though they would later return in higher numbers. Upon their return, the crowd lit trash ablaze and threw it into the bar, presumably with police inside, which resulted in the police using a fire hose against the mob. However, Marsha P. Johnson, a famous drag queen and gay activist, rest in power, noted that the fire initially present in the bar was started by the police, not the crowd, but that the crowd later added to it with the trash throwing. Eventually, the rioting would die down, but at this point, it had raised more questions than answers. While the Stonewall Uprising is often observed as a singular event, in reality, the protest stretched over six days. The first night was a spontaneous protest spurred by police action but consecutive protests included members of the media, agitators, and people from all around New York City who arrived to participate in or watch the spectacle. It was not the first time the police raided a gay bar. If anything, it was people expressing their frustration with the continued persecution while in their safe spaces. Stonewall is oftentimes referred to as the singular event that changed the gay discourse of the U.S., but in reality, it was only able to happen because of progress made in prior activism. Such an event would have been inconceivable even 10 years prior. 
Historians have noted that the shift in activism, if Stonewall truly represented one at all, was a shift primarily for white cisgender people, as people of color and gender nonconforming people never truly had the benefit of concealing their marginalized identities. Additionally, while almost everyone can agree that the Stonewall Uprising was historically significant, people disagree as to whether the event should be referred to as riots, protests, uprisings, or a rebellion. These events are most commonly referred to as riots, but Stonewall veterans have stated that they prefer the term Stonewall Uprising or Rebellion. Regardless of what they should be called, after the events unfolded, gay society would have to come up with a framework for understanding them. The homophile movement, aka the organized groups of LGBT activists that started in response to the Lavender Scare, staging modest protests and winning through the court of law, didn't know what to make of the Stonewall Uprising. Homophile activists were not present inside the Stonewall when the raid occurred, and some movement leaders denounced the violence of the riots. But other LGBT activists participated in the street protests. Many promoted the mass mobilization that followed, and the homophile movement helped create the conditions that made the rebellion possible in the first place. People love to talk about how the Stonewall Uprising was the first gay movement where people fought back, but it wouldn't have even been possible without the careful, predictable, and approachable activism of the earlier homophile movement. With that said, after the Stonewall movement, there was a palpable need for more assertive forms of activism. Some activists broke off from the now-considered conservative Mattachine societies to form the GLF, or Gay Liberation Front, a more radical movement with similar goals of equality. However, both of these groups were primarily white, and devoid of people like sex workers, transgenders, and queer women, all extremely key components of the activism at Stonewall. In turning their backs on people who would protect them, white gays were attempting to climb the rungs of society's ladder without extending a hand to those below them. Women, queer and not, were extremely important to moving gay rights forward, but were often ignored by the gay men and other allies of their time and even now. However, they were able to form their own groups within the movement explicitly dedicated to the expression of feminine power. Noted in Gay Liberation Lesbian Feminism by Mark Stein, some women didn't even want to be associated with men in general, stating that, quote, lesbians are not only fighting against the institutions of male heterosexual power and privilege, but are attacking the very foundations of the male worldview, a view which is based on competition, aggression, and acquisitiveness. Lesbians choose to reject that worldview, and to live apart from men who have perpetuated those values for thousands of years, end quote. This viewpoint is understandable, especially considering the treatment of women by society at the time of which they were subjected to. Despite the imbalance between different activist groups and disagreement on how to push the LGBT message forward, LGBT rights slowly but surely began to improve in the 1970s. In 1973, the American Psychological Association or APA, removed homosexuality as a mental illness from the DSM, or Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. However, the AIDS crisis of the 1980s would once again prove to be a setback for the gay perception by society. The 1990s, with the military's infamous policy of don't ask, don't tell, and the continued mistreatment of gay people in general, wasn't much better. However, at this time, there were also drag queens and queer activists fighting for our rights, and slowly but surely making a dent in society's perception. Individuals like RuPaul and Divine were releasing music, films, and going on talk shows for the first time, oftentimes to a stunned audience. But people wanted to know more, and slowly but surely the straight society became enamored with gay culture. However, those not in the know, and believe me, it was most of them, still saw gay people as a bizarre freak of nature. It wasn't until the 2000s when gay best friend culture really began to hit the mainstream with movies like Clueless and Mean Girls that people began to see gay people as harmless and wanted to learn more about them. Obviously, this is a massive, sweeping oversimplification of what happened between the Stonewall Uprising and now. Important figures have been left out and important events have been ignored. The point, however, is that in the 2000s, gay people and drag queens were finally tolerated by American society and could finally exist without fear of random, legally permissible prosecution for the sake of their sexuality. This brings us to the present. Unfortunately, despite the massive progress we have made as a community, 
it still seems that wider straight society has learned little from decades of everyday exposure to gay people. It's not like we just randomly merged out of the shadows. Our ability to exist in our own niche of society has been fought for tooth and nail by the marginalized individuals on the fringes of society with no choice but to fight. While white gays are able to comfortably assimilate into our communities with no one batting an eye, queer people of color often face direct violence at home and from authorities, with no one to protect them and no lawyers to call. It is for them in particular that we need to continually fight for gay causes. Half a century after the Stonewall Uprising, with the rise of Christian nationalism in the U.S., it feels like many gay people of our generation are truly understanding what it feels like to be persecuted for the first time. Recently, bills have been introduced in state legislatures that ban drag, classifying it as a form of adult cabaret in line with strippers and go-go dancers, which means that appearing as a drag queen in public could be considered obscene and liable to prosecution. Tennessee introduced one of the most oppressive of these drag bans, classifying the impersonation of another gender as being in the prurient interest, which implies that drag performances are inherently sexual. After being passed by the legislature, it was struck down by a federal judge, who stated that if Tennessee wishes to exercise its police power in restricting speech it considers obscene, it must do so within the constraints and framework of the U.S. Constitution. This bill was halted for violations of freedom of speech and expression, but other copycat bills across the country have yet to be challenged. Worse, now that some of the shakier bills are being struck down, legislators are contemplating whether a bill resembling the Texas Bounty Hunter framework for identifying abortion seekers could be implemented in the form of a drag ban. A bill like this would be a worst-case scenario for drag queens. This is why it is exceedingly important to vote in every election even for those at a state level. If anything, I would argue that voting in state and local elections is more important than voting in presidential elections, as these will be the authorities that can actually impact your life in any discernible way. Conservatives see drag queens, trans people, and even cisgender gay people as different sides of the same coin, which is why it falls on all of us to vote them out. Any legislation passed against one group opens the floor to legislation passed against another something that we simply cannot accept. Thank you for watching, and here's my sources. Have a great rest of your day.